We you take your Bibles and open to John chapter 15? John 15. <clears throat> did, uh, did, did you see or do you remember seeing the Jesus Gets Us commercials? They were pretty uh, highly polished. They were kind of black and white, made a big splash because they, they purchased time during the Super Bowl for several of the commercials. It would show scenes in, usually in which there was some kind of uh, suffering or difficulty and then point out that Jesus went through things like that. So they might show some scenes of poverty and point out that the scriptures tell us that Jesus was impoverished. Uh, and so, you know, things like that. And, and the tagline at the end was, he gets us, he gets all of us, something like that. Now, uh, a couple things about that. I'm not here to promote that or criticize it. Um, this is not my personal cup of tea. I prefer thinking, you know, you can get to know people around you and talk to them about their lives and you'll have opportunities to show how Jesus gets you. And that's a, a good evangelistic and outreach method. Um, but at the same time, you know, there was a lot of creativity that went into these things. And quite frankly, it's a commercial during the Super Bowl. It was a lot of money somebody gave up to put this out there just to start conversations about Jesus. And, and for that, you know, I, I appreciate the heart. In fact, I'm kind of convicted by it. It helped, you know, do I have the heart to make those kinds of sacrifices in order to honor Christ and see him uh, proclaimed and heard? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you all that because I want to get to this, this thought. I saw some criticism of those commercials from people who were, were, were not churched here was their concern, their, their fear was that, that these were um, Trojan horses. They were designed to get your attention, to get you to come in and listen to sort of a, a Christian thing that would make you a conservative voter. Like the goal of all that money spent was to make you a, a you know, a Republican, I guess. And and I thought, I'm almost sure that wasn't true. I can't imagine that's, that was the goal behind the He Gets Us campaign is to make you a Republican. But what happens when someone hears this message about Jesus, even if it's just in a you know, one-minute commercial, and what they think is the most important thing in life is, is politics and power, and they're going to take what they heard, filter it through that grid, and say, this must have a political purpose. And so they couldn't hear the message about Jesus. It only provoked. Now, we're coming to a passage where Jesus is going to talk about persecution and opposition. And, and because the only places I've really ever lived were kind of Bible Belt places in the Southeast or the Midwest and, and you know, places where persecution doesn't seem like that big of a threat. I, I, there was one time I was talking to a guy who threatened me. Probably I was being rude to obnoxious. And so I was being persecuted for obnoxious sake, not for Christ's sake. Um, I don't think I've ever really felt any kind of serious threat because I'm a Christian. And so I come to this passage and, and I, I wrestled with it for three weeks because, you know, we had, you know, Nathan and, and, um, and Rick preaching the last two weeks. And so I had time to think about this. And I just got to tell you, if, if we weren't just going through the book of John, I'd probably pick a different passage. But here Jesus says something to his disciples and it would have been meaningful to them, maybe not that night but absolutely the next day. And right now, right now, there are 360 million Christians in the world who fear the loss of their property, the loss of their freedom, or even the loss of their lives today. And so this passage would have said to them something. And quite frankly, I'm not a big fan of the fear-mongering, let's all be active because this bad thing could happen. 
But Jesus says this is the ordinary course of things. And it may be that this is what you will face. And if not you, your children or grandchildren. And this scripture tells us not only what is coming, but how we can face it. Before we read it, would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we don't want to skip any parts of your word to receive exactly what you have revealed, to help us see what it says about Jesus and about us and about the calling you've placed on our lives to believe your word. And Father, I, I know that there are folks here today who, who long for the kind of help this passage promises. Maybe it's not persecution from a neighbor or the world, it, it's, it's an oppression from their own guilt and sin or their own personal accusations. Maybe it's oppression from the sinful tendencies that remain in our hearts so we recognize we could easily be in opposition to you. Perhaps, O oh Lord, there is a spiritual power that is seeking to persecute and obstruct your church. That is true. And all of it because we have come to know Jesus and want to follow him. And so we pray, would you help us see the calling you've placed on us and the help that you give, that we might live in truth. I pray that you would strengthen all those who feel weak today, that you would lift them up and encourage them because you have already walked this path in front of us. You have reached the end and you will not let us fall on the way. Father, we pray that you would nourish and encourage your church, your people who love you and who pray in Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 15, we're gonna start reading in verse 18. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? If the world hates you, Know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogue. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. This is God's word. It is completely true and utterly trustworthy. Please be seated. <clears throat> when I was a kid growing up, you would, I would say something like this. I am starving. And that usually meant that it had been at least three hours since I had last eaten something. And I was really in the mood for some kind of snack or something along the way. That's, that's the equivalent. And my mother would not let me get away with that. And she would say, you know what? You're not starving. If you were starving, that's a different thing. That, that kind of hyperbole wasn't acceptable to her because there were people who were starving, and there are. And so we just weren't allowed to exaggerate like that. I was allowed to say I was hungry. I was allowed to say I wanted a snack. And the truth be told, most of the time it was probably 
I'm bored, and eating was a way to sort of push off boredom. So I was, I, but I wasn't allowed to say I was bored, so I could just say I was hungry. I wasn't really allowed to say I'm freezing. I didn't get the same reaction about freezing as I did starving, but, you know, that's the sort of thing. I was never freezing. I was never starving. I was rarely hungry or even cold, for that matter. So it just really wasn't the kind of language I was allowed to use. I wasn't allowed to say hate. It's just a word that's too powerful. And most of the time it meant I didn't like it or it wasn't my favorite thing. I hate this food. I hate this job. I hate this whatever. I I certainly wasn't allowed to say I hate this person. That word was too expensive. It cheapened everything else. If I used that word, there was no word that was left for when hate was real. And so I had to preserve those words. I kind of have the same thing. Uh, I do not think I've ever had an awesome ice cream cone. But I know I've heard us, you know, say, I, I, this, this ice cream's awesome. I don't think we, I, I think it's, it's the, these words are too rich. And yet Jesus uses the word hate, I think eight times in this passage. And, and my experience of the world and its reaction to me as a Christian, I almost never would have used the word hate. Now, that might mean that Jesus is talking about something specific these disciples would go through. They would be hated, and that's absolutely true. Uh, Paul, who's not in this number, would certainly understand the word hate. He described it like this. To be an apostle was like getting a sentence of death. And every one of the disciples that are in the room with Jesus here, 11, would all die uh, un, what we would call untimely deaths, except for John. And John would be imprisoned and exiled. They would all suffer because of their connection to Jesus, because of their ministry in his name. And of course, chief among them was Jesus, who this is, remember, all this is taking place from chapter about 13 all the way through chapter mm, 19, all of it's taking place on Thursday. Thursday night, then Friday morning early. All of this takes place in just a few hours. And as he is telling them these things, the world has hated me, it's gonna hate you, is only a few hours before, probably less than a few hours, maybe only an hour before he would be arrested. Only a couple of hours before he would be put in front of unjust trials. Only a very short time before the sun would rise and they would take him and have him executed like a common criminal. And in that moment, these words were intended to help the apostles, these disciples. But not just in that moment. Because what they were supposed to see in Jesus on that Friday, Thursday night and Friday, was if they hated him, they're gonna hate you. This is the same path you're gonna go on. And they would need resources to be able to bear it. So I want you to look at this passage with me and see the hostile world that Jesus calls you to and the helping spirit he gives you and the honest truth for you to endure, right? Hostile world, helping spirit, and honest truth. Let's start with the hostile world. He tells you why the world is hostile toward Christians. Look at verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. He says that the world's opposition is stirred up against you because it can't own you. It can't understand you. If the world lives with this pursuit of power and you're like, I don't have any interest in that kind of power. 
It won't understand you, and it won't be able to respond to you the way you saw in those commercials and their criticism. Because something new has happened to you. What the world must have is something that, that tries to satisfy this is deep longing, a spiritual thirst that can only be satisfied in Jesus. But it's pursued in every arena. I will pursue it with my work, with my possessions, with pleasures, with power, with honor. Look at the, the uh, Pharisees that were around Jesus. They wanted to be recognized as important people. You undoubtedly work with folks and perhaps you felt it, where that job gives you significance or influence. It try, you're trying to get it to satisfy that deep longing of, of importance and significance. But something new has happened to you. You found a new love. Instead of pursuing these things that the world offers and holds out as, as beautiful and filling, you now have Jesus and your heart's going after him. And it changes the way that you operate. You start to operate by grace, not merit. Instead of looking around at people and saying, look who's achieved, who's accomplished, those are the important people, you start looking at everyone and say, hey, it's the needy people who get my help because they all matter. It changes the way you think about everything. So just, let's do this. There's a, a business owner. He has two employees. One is a man who thinks his job, his job performance makes him significant. It's the thing he lives for. That business owner looks at him and says, I like him because he's mine. He gives me all that I want from an employee because he devotes his life to me. And he probably doesn't think it out that way. He just really likes the, the performance. Now, the same business owner has an employee who's come to know Jesus. And this employee comes to work and he works hard, but he thinks the thing that matters most is that I operate as, an, as, as a person who does what's best for others. And sometimes that will come into conflict with the high-performing person who says the job's the only thing that matters. And now I can't promise him a, 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 a raise, a promotion to get him to do what I want. I don't own him. As I was listening and thinking and studying about this, I heard two preachers preaching in this passage use the same illustration. So I figure, must be good. The illustration was when C. Everett Koop was, uh, became the Surgeon General under Ronald Reagan. And on the, the front page of the New York Times, he was called Dr. Unqualified. You know why? Because he was pro-life. And so the entire left really didn't like him and thought this was the worst possible choice for someone who would be Surgeon General. But while he was there under Reagan, he began to see the rise of HIV and AIDS. And he said, this is causing great suffering. We need to spend millions of dollars to find a way to treat it. But it was primarily in the 80s, uh, a disease that was affecting a community that the right didn't care about, gay men mostly. And so when he began to become very public and seek to have policy affected and budgets affected for this small group that the right didn't care about at the time, then the right said, you're the enemy now, and the left started loving him. And when Reagan finished his term as president, C. Everett Koop was persona non grata with everybody because they didn't know who could control him. And the reason is because he couldn't be controlled. They didn't own him. Jesus did. The world cannot take away from you what you most desire. You have Jesus. And it can't offer you something that will pull your eyes off of him. And so it can't control you. 
If you loved what they loved, if you chased money and pleasure and power, then they can advertise and get you. They can understand you. But if you show conviction that's out of step with your community, they will hate you. Land in a community that tends to be more politically liberal with a biblical conviction about sexuality, even one that's very humble, that says this is the way for human flourishing and it's what's good for a person and the community. And I know it is hard for people whose inner desires and thoughts conflict with their bodies, but it's still God's way and it still can be trusted. Even that humble conviction, and you will be hated, land in a community that's more politically conservative, and argue that living by grace has shown you that personal, individual responsibility is not a great guiding principle for life. And it should show up in the way that you treat others, particularly the needy, and that taking care of the needy among us is the healthiest thing for our community. Say that consistently and you'll probably be hated. The world can't own you and it can't control you, and it can't understand you, so it hates you. But it doesn't just hate you. Look at verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Or in verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Verse 23, whoever hates me hates my father also. The world can't accept Jesus, and so it hates you for accepting him. Why can't it accept Jesus? See, there's this deep-seated hatred for Jesus that comes out when you represent him, when you point to him, when your life, your words point people to Jesus. And here are a couple of reasons. Let me just give two. One they don't like authority. Let's look through history. If, uh, if Aristotle is who he says he is, then people can research him, study him, learn from him, or reject him. It doesn't matter. If Jesus is who he says he is, then the only logical response to him is to say, every decision I make should be oriented about what you've taught me. Every last one. From, from what job I assume, from how I conduct my family, how I spend my money and, money and what I do with my body. All of it belongs to you if you're who you say you are. And so Jesus comes and he says, I, I get everything. And the world says, oh no, I can give you the religious component of my life, maybe. If you only want me to be okay for an hour a week or a couple hours, we could probably work that in. But if you get everything, that's not okay. That kind of authority is hated. The other thing we don't like is dependence. If you tell someone, listen, you need to live a good life to get into heaven, they will go, oh, all right, that makes sense. I'm not very good at it, but I'll try again tomorrow. If you tell them, you can't live a good enough life. So what you have to do is stop trusting yourself and lean entirely on Jesus. They hate it. Truth be told, so did you and I. We hated it too. Until something happened. You see, you and I felt the same hostility while we were still weak, while we were still sinners is when Christ came to die for us. When, when we were, had the same opposition to Jesus, he came for us. And so he gives you even now the helping spirit. Look at it with me at verse 26. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. You see, this is really what has happened if you are here today as a person who looks at Jesus and says, I'm gonna follow him. 
It is because the Spirit has borne witness to him and persuaded you of his truth. It is because he has overcome that opposition that is normal in our hearts. It's because he has helped you see that our hatred was without cause. End of verse 25. I hated him, but I didn't have any good reasons because he came to love me. And only the Spirit can help us see that because he bears witness to Jesus. He shows us him. He moves us away from the things the world loves. He shows them as empty, and he shows Jesus as fulfilling. He shows us that what our souls have longed for is actually Jesus, not power, not money, not possessions, not the approval of men, not honor of any sort but Jesus. And then, after he brings you to Jesus, you no longer fit in the world and you start to experience the same opposition he experiences, so he keeps bearing witness to Jesus. He says to your soul, yes, this persecution and hatred is awful and it hurts, but Jesus is worth it. He continues to speak into your heart Jesus is the one who is worth whatever you must endure to have him. And he continues to say, look at him, behold him, hear from him. And he shows you this is actually the same path he went when you hated him. He went to the cross. He was persecuted when we had no interest in him. And so he is not calling you to live into a world in any way that he has not already done. He has blazed this trail for you. He has marched ahead of you and said, now follow me. And here's what happens. Are you ready? You come into this world and you have come to see Jesus and you like him. In fact, you love him. But you know that your love has to grow and you need more of him to do so. So the Spirit brings you along the same path that Jesus walked so that you can fellowship with him. If they hated me, they will hate you. And the only way for you to understand the depths of his love is to go underneath the same hate that he bore. The only way for you to commune with Jesus deeply and richly is to fellowship not only in his victory, but also in his sufferings, to share in his cross and his resurrection. And so as you go and experience the disdain, the contempt of the world occasionally, at that point you go, and Jesus did more of this than I am, and he did it for me. And if they hate me, at least there's some reason. I contribute to the problem. They hate him without cause. And so every time I experience any of this opposition, I get to taste more deeply my Savior because that's what the Holy Spirit helps you do. And then watch this what happens. Verse 27, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. You see, you, in enduring the opposition of the world for the sake of Jesus and the world, are reenacting what Jesus has done. You're bearing witness with your lives. Jesus took a cross for the sake of this world that hated him. For God so loved this world that he wouldn't even withhold his son, but gave him up for us. That instead of condemnation, we might have eternal life through faith in Jesus. Do you you see it? As you reenact Jesus, you bear witness to him. I would ask you this question. 
if you were called to suffer loss so that the world might believe, e- even just a few in the world, would it be worth it to you? I think most of you would say, at least in the abstract and in this room, yes. And the reason you would say yes is because you've seen that's what Jesus did for me. And I wanna bear witness to that. And so Jesus gives them the helping spirit, but he also gives them the honest truth. Look at chapter 16, verse one. I have said these things to keep you from falling away. And most people, when they warn you, hey, people are gonna try to destroy you, what they're really trying to do is to get you to open your pocketbook or go vote. Jesus says, people are gonna try to destroy you. I just want you to be surprised. I want you to think something went wrong. I'm telling you today, when no one's trying to hurt you, this is the ordinary way. When they try to come after you, you follow me because I've conquered the grave. And they can't hurt you. I'm in charge. Chapter, verse two, they will put you out of the synagogue They will drive you away. They'll think when they do it, they're offering service to God and they will do these things because they have not known the Father or me. But I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, you'll remember that I told you. It may be that the day is coming, maybe not too far from now, when even in the Bible Belt, things get harder to be a Christian. When, when employers will look at you and think, you're a Christian, and now they think you can't be trusted, your judgment is suspect because you're superstitious. The day may come when, because people hear you're a Christian, they will assume that you are bigoted and evil and, a, and bad for society. And that may come here in the Bible Belt. Just know, Jesus said, That's the ordinary Christian. They hated me. Of course they'll hate you. But don't fall away. Don't get discouraged. You know the truth. And inside you have the Holy Spirit who's come to help you. And he will bear witness to your very heart. Jesus is true and you can trust him even when it hurts. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, the scriptures tell us that though you were rich, you became poor for our sakes, that we might become rich toward God, reconciled to him. And All of the apostles, even Paul, who comes later, bore witness to you, suffering in their bodies, losing their freedom and their possessions and their honor, and yet, even their lives, and yet they followed you because they knew by the Spirit's testimony in their soul that you were the true north, you were the the true desire of our hearts, And nothing in the world can take that away from us. Spirit, would you come and sink that truth into our hearts? That we might be willing to suffer or at least sacrifice for the sake of your testimony, for the sake of the witness of Jesus, because you bore witness to us. The love of God would endure anything to rescue us. Now let us love that way. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.